Greetings, friends and brethren. This is Dr. Bob Teal from the Continuing Church of God. Today I'd like to talk about a late second century Church of God leader by the name of Melito. And I want to talk about the Passover, actually what Melito said about the Passover. In the late second century, uh, Melito gave a short sermon called his homily on the Passover. And before I get into that, I'd like to talk about Melito quite a bit. First, I want to start off with what the Catholic Encyclopedia says about him in an article called St. Melito. Bishop, which would be also an overseer, of Sardis, prominent ecclesiastical writer in the latter half of the second century. Uh, there's a letter of Polycrates of Ephesus to uh, Bishop of Rome Victor around 194 that states Melito. Uh, his whole walk was in the Holy Spirit, so it means he was faithful. He was buried in uh, Sardis, and he'd been one of the great authorities in the Church of Asia who held to the quartodecimant theory. Now, let me stop right there. What's the quartodecimant theory? Well, quartodecimant means 14th. The quartodecimant belief, which comes from the Bible, by the way, is that the Passover is on the 14th, which is what the Bible actually says. People such as Melito uh, kept to keeping the Passover on the 14th. And by the way, the word uh, Melito means honey, which is a Greek word, okay, which is why people said Melito is a Greek and he wasn't a Jew. So he was keeping the Passover on a biblical date, but the Catholic Encyclopedia is calling that theory. But uh, that's what Jesus did, that's what uh, the Jews did, that's what the Bible says to do, and that's what early Christians did. And that's, by the way, what we in the Continuing Church of God do to this day. Anyway, getting back to uh, Melito, it says his name is cited in something called the Labyrinth of the Roman Bishop Hippolytus as one of the second century writers who taught the duality of natures of Jesus. It says Jerome, speaking of the canon of Melito, that's when Melito helped define the Old Testament, which we'll get to in a moment, quotes Tertullian's statement that Melito was esteemed a prophet by many of the faithful. Of uh, Melito's numerous works, almost all have perished. Uh, Eusebius preserved the names of the majority of them and gives a few extracts, uh, uh, and that was pretty much it. Uh, his uh, well, On the Passover was probably written in 167 to 168, according to the Catholic Encyclopedia. And we also see that uh, he kept the, uh, the 14th, the date of Melito, like Polycarp, kept the biblical date. Now, if just a moment ago, I just read they called it the Court Adjustment Theory, but now they're in the Catholic Encyclopedia saying, well, it's the biblical date. That's correct. It's the date that we, the Continuing Church of God, uh, keep. And let's see, if you talk about some other things with there, but the, the various site works that he did, 14 of which were cited by the uh, historian under Constantine by the name of Eusebius back in the 4th century. So anyway, we learn from the Catholic Encyclopedia that uh, Melito wrote a lot. He lived in Sardis, which is one of the cities of Asia Minor, one of the seven uh, churches that uh, Jesus told the Apostle John to address his uh, letters to. He, was now where, he wasn't anywhere near Rome. We've got some of the things that uh, he uh, wrote that have been preserved. And he did not switch over to a, an Easter Sunday date. He continued to keep Passover. And for various reasons, we, the Continuing Church of God, contend that he held views, Melito held views, consistent with that, of the original Catholic Church, not the Church of Rome. The original Catholic Church, by the way, I'm going to hold up a, a free book that we have, uh, called Belize the Original Catholic Church, which you can find online free at uh, www.ccog.org. Go to ccog.org, go to the literature tab, click on books and booklets, and then, for example, covers of our uh, books and booklets will show up. We do not ask for your email address. We don't ask for any money. You can check it out, what we teach. Anyway, Melito held to the views of the original Catholic Church and the views that we, the Continuing Church of God, hold to today. Yet the Church of Rome, who considers Melito to be a, a saint, does not hold to his views on, uh, for example, 
the nature of God or the complete Old Testament or uh, the date of uh, a Passover. All right, having said that, uh, Melito was the earliest church leader we know of who wanted to uh, investigate what books were supposed to be in what we call the Old Testament. Matter of fact, Melito was the first person, as far as we know, who used the term Old Testament. Now, it's not that the early Christian leaders in places like Jerusalem didn't know what the books were, because those are the books that they were using. They were using the same books uh, Jesus used, which were the same books that are in uh, uh, Bibles such as, for example, the New King James Version of the Bible. Now, the Church of Rome, as well as the Eastern Orthodox Church, well, they have extra books, those uh, which they call deuterocanonical books, which means the second canon. But Melito didn't include those. And how do we know? Well, we, not only does the Church of Rome realize this, but Melito wrote this letter to his brother Onesimus. He says, As you've often prompted by your regard for the Word of God, expressed a wish to have some extracts made of the Law and the Prophets concerning the Savior and concerning our faith in general, and have desired, moreover, to have an accurate account of the ancient books as regard to their number and their arrangement. I have striven to the best of my ability to perform this task. Now understand that Sardis is not anywhere near Jerusalem. Melito is not a Jew. And so while he was using the same books uh, that Polycarp and uh, we use now, people still had some confusion because some people said, oh, but what about this book or what about these books? So he says, uh, well, knowing your zeal and your eagerness to become acquainted with the word, especially because I am assured that through your yearning from after God, you esteem these sayings above all else, uh, engaged as you are in a struggle for eternal salvation. So I accordingly proceeded to the east and went to the very spot where the things in question were preached and took place. And having made myself accurately acquainted with the books of the Old Testament, I set them forth down as follows. So you just heard him use the term Old Testament. So the term was probably being used before Melito, but Melito is the first person that we've seen any, we have a record of who actually, in writing, called it that. And then he lists them. For example, the first five books of Moses, calls us Exodus, excuse me, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Then uh, Judges, Josh, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, four books of Kings, two of Chronicles, now, you say, wait a second, we only have two books of Kings and two Chronicles. Well, actually, First and Second Samuel were considered a part of the books of Kings before they were kind of renamed. Uh, Psalms of David, Proverbs of uh, Solomon, uh, also called the Book of Wisdom, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, Job, the books of the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and 12 contained in a single book. And also uh, Daniel, Ezekiel, and Ezra. And I made these and uh, lists out. So these are the books in the Old Testament that uh, most Jews, Protestants, and those in the churches of God uh, use. Some think Esther was uh, left out for political reasons, but I, I think actually when I look at how books were combined, I think he included it as well. Now, an Anglican scholar noted, oh, before I, yeah, this reminds me something I was going to pull up here. Oh, I covered it up. <laughs> we have another book called Who Gave the World the Bible, which is also free at ccog.org. So anyway, I'm going to quote an Anglican scholar, uh, 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 Stuart Sykes, Al Alistair St St Stuart Sykes, this fragment is highly significant as the first Christian Old Testament canon. It's of interest to note that Melito traveled to Palestine and is thus an indication that this is the Old Testament canon known by the Palestinian Christians and perhaps the Jews. And of course it's the same one used by the Jews, but he, he put the perhaps in there. Anyway, so we've got a book, Who Gave the World the Bible? Now I realize many people think that the Catholic Church did. Well, 
The original Catholic Church, which is the Church of God in Smyrna, because that's the first time the term Catholic Church was used, by the way, the first three times actually been referring to that church, uh, kept the records of the Bible, but the, God gave the world the Bible, but he did have it preserved, and the knowledge of it known by the Church of God uh, throughout history. Now, I realize the Church of Rome claims that that's, they're the ones who gave the world the Bible, but it's kind of interesting because they kind of base that upon uh, their St. Jerome's uh, Latin Vulgate Bible. Now, what's interesting about Jerome, and this talk about in this book, is he went down to uh, Palestine as well, and he talked to a Judeo-Christian to figure out what the books of the Bible were. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting that people think, oh, that Jerome... The Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church through Jerome gave the world the Bible, but actually uh, Jerome learned what the books were from, or from the uh, probably a Church of God person over there. Now the interesting thing is Jerome did not have. I mean, I'm getting to Jerome. Jerome, when he put his first version of the Bible together, did not have the deuterocanonical books in them either. Again, he was probably familiar with what Melito wrote. He also went and talked to somebody, uh, one of our type of uh, Christians, we think, and so he left him out. But then a, a pope finally told him he had to do that, so he uh, uh, put it in. But the fact, of course, that Melito called something the Old Testament suggests that they called something else the New Testament, and that they knew what the books of the New Testament were as well. And I will also say, well, it took centuries for the Greco-Roman churches to finalize their canon. The Church of God knew the canon from the beginning. Now, you may find that hard to believe. Uh, and it's interesting. I actually wrote for Wikipedia, I don't know, 20, 25 years ago, I think, when I used to write for them, and explained that there was an alternative view of where the canon came from. Basically, that uh, uh, Peter uh, collected uh, uh, some books, including... Uh, the Apostle uh, Paul's writings, and those ended up with John, and John passes on to people such as Polycarp. And they put that as an alternative explanation, and they pulled it out. Now, what was odd is back then, Wikipedia professed to have no point of view, which meant they were open to facts, supposedly, and other options as opposed to one prevailing point of view. But the prevailing point of view amongst the uh, Greco-Roman Catholics and the Protestants, by the way, is that People weren't sure what the books of the Bible were. Some Protestants, however, agree with us in the Church of God that it was known by early Christians in the beginning. And what Melito did was just uh, go back and verify that the books of the Old Testament uh, that we use are the correct ones to use, and that's what he concluded, by the way. Yeah, and the Catholic Encyclopedia says this about uh, the canon of the Old Testament. St. Melito, Bishop of Sardis, first drew up a list of canonical books of the Old Testament. While he kept the uh, familiar arrangement of the Septuagint, and he said he verified his uh, inquiry among the, the Jews. Uh, the Jew or Jews everywhere by that time had dis discarded the Alexandrian books. Okay, those are the extra books, the deuterocanonical books. And so that's what Melito did, and that's the same thing with Jesus had done as well. But un sadly, the Greco-Romans have those books is part of their Bible. But interestingly, the Eastern Orthodox claim, well, the books aren't, they're scripture, but they're not quite the same level as the rest of the scripture. It's like, oh, it's either the word of God or it's not. And they say, what's well, the word of God? It's, it really isn't quite as much. Well, it's not the word of God. It's not like everything in those extra books is useless. They have some historical value and some other things about that. We can, some things we can learn about that. But again, Melito helped verify that, yes, the books we have in the Old Testament are the right books. So that's one way people have been influenced by Melito to this day, including the fact most people probably haven't even heard of Melito of Sardis. Now, uh, regarding uh, Melito, uh, a in the 19th century, uh, the scholars uh, Robertson Donaldson wrote, Melito, he very probably knew the blessed Polycarp. He is justly revered for the diligence with he sought out the evidence in this day which established the canon of the Old Testament. 
So they're agreeing, agreeing that uh, Melito verified the canon of the Old Testament. Now, something else about Melito is he was a Benetarian. He was not a Trinitarian. His writings specifically say that the Father was God and Jesus was God. What about the Holy Spirit? Well, actually, here's what he said about the Holy Spirit. The tongue of the Lord, his Holy Spirit. In this psalm, my tongue is a pen. That's one of the things Melito wrote. Here's the other thing Melito wrote. The finger of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, by whose operation the tables of the law in Exodus are said to have been written. So if you go to Exodus chapter 34, I'm going to read verse 1, which says, and, and the Lord, which would be eternal, or Yahweh, said to Moses, Cut two tables of stone like the first ones, and I will write on tablets the words which are the first tablet which you broke. So when Melito says that the finger of the Lord is what uh, the Holy Spirit was, who wrote on the uh, Ten Commandments, he's just showing that the Holy Spirit is the power of God. That not that he's some third person in uh, the Greco-Roman Trinity. Now, another thing about Melito, and this comes uh, also from the uh, 19th century, it was published in 1855 by a, uh, an author by the name of D.T. Taylor. He said, Melito, he was Bishop of Sardis, he was born in Asia Minor, he was a bishop of one of the apocalyptic churches, and was so eloquent, eloquent and deeply pious that the historian Tertullian, uh, early 3rd century, affirms he was by most Christians considered a, a prophet. And Polycrates says of him, he was all, in all things governed by the Holy Ghost. He made the extract of scriptures respecting the Messianic prophecies, and he wrote a treatise on the book of Revelation, and he made out a complete list of the canonical books of the Old Testament. He was a Kiliast. Now, what is a Kiliast? Kiliasm uh, has seduced millennium. In regard to his views of that period, he probably followed uh, Papias. Uh, Jerome and Ganadias both affirmed that Melito was declared millenarian. He was believed in millennium. Even the 19th century theologian uh, Neander admits that Polycarp Papias Melito, quote, endeavored to maintain the pure and simple apostolic doctrine and defend it against corruption. It says the time of his, uh, man of his death is unknown, but he was buried in Sardis, waiting for his name uh, in the book of life for the first resurrection waiting with his name. Okay. So we read about some of these things, and the reality is, yes, that Polycarp, Papias, and Melito, and their faithful successors strove to maintain the pure apostolic doctrine and to defend it against corruption. That's part of why Melito strongly taught against idols. He also taught against relying on traditions, religious traditions, and he also stood for the truth about the millennial reign of Christ, which you can read about in the 20th chapter of the book of Revelation. As far as the millennium, the Catholic Encyclopedia, which calls him a saint, says, a witness for the continued belief in millenarianism in the province of Asia Minor is Saint Melito, Bishop of Sardis in the second century. Although the Church of Rome considers Melito to be a saint, the millennial doctrine is the only doctrine that's included in the current catechism of the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church. It's the only doctrine associated with Antichrist in that book. And of course, that's absurd. And true saints still hold to the millennial doctrine, which is, uh, as I mentioned, laid out in places such as the 20th chapter of the book of Revelation. A, uh, a Protestant scholar by the name of Philip Schaff, a fairly famous one, said, Melito was a Kiliast. That means people need millennium. Eusebius is the first to give us an idea about the number of varieties of his writings, and he does little more than mention the titles. 
a fact to be explained only by his lack of sympathy for Melito's views. Okay, now this is very important. Melito wrote a paper against Marcion. Marcion was the first person to do away with the Sabbath, or one of the first people, maybe, maybe Simon Magus did, but one of the ones that we know did was Marcion and some other types of things. And it's basically believed that Eusebius didn't want Emperor Constantine to know all that stuff. You say, but wait a second, there are some things that Melito uh, believed the Passover was on the 14th and things like that. Well, that's actually why Emperor Constantine called the Council of uh, Nicaea. That was one of, the, one of the main reasons. And so Eusebius didn't have any problem bringing up the fact that there was a controversy. You know, some people said this, some people said that. So that's one of the reasons why we know this. And also, by the way, for the Council of Nicaea, which was in 325 AD, it was not a Trinitarian council. It was an anti-Unitarian council. And uh, most of the people who attended it, by the way, according to Roman Catholic sources, most of the people who attended the Council of Nicaea, the bishops of uh, the Greco-Roman churches, were Binitarian. They usually call them semi-Arian, but Binitarian, the vast majority. So Melito's writings were semi-Arian or Binitarian, so the, those parts, Eusebius didn't seem to mind anybody seeing them. Anyway, the reality is that uh, early true saints held to many beliefs that the Greco-Roman churches no longer hold. By the way, this is a statue supposed to be a representation of Polycarp of Smyrna, somebody who had direct apostolic succession. And we include him in our apostolic succession list, which also includes, by the way, Melito. Now, various ones thought that Melito was a prophet, so he was a prophetic overseer, if you will, uh, sort of like, somewhat like me, if you will. And back in 2007, I made an attempt to translate something he wrote about prophets. Uh, this is from something called H. Paulson Papyrus Oxyrhynchus 1.5 Undai, typically called Melito and the Prophets. It's believed Melito wrote it, and here's how I translated it, and I had somebody else review my translation to make sure it, was, it made sense. Melito wrote, You, meaning God, give the gift of prophecy through your spirit in your way. We'll get back to that in a moment. You slave men with illness, therefore your spirit is most holy. The Lord's counsel is food, in this way uh, opposing until he has a divine spirit. For the prophecies of the Spirit speak, searching, they bring forth your majesty. You anoint the body, providing the tools. You variously anoint humanity with your festivals. So there's two basic points I'd like to make about this. One, we see that Melito says God gives the gift of prophecy his way. Now since Melito was considered a prophet, he may have written that line to remind his critics that God decides how to give the gift of prophecy, not humans. And a lot of people don't understand that. Even though the Bible is very clear in the book of Numbers that God uses dreams, for example, for prophets, a lot of people think, oh no, you have to have some major organization, have a big meeting and declare somebody a prophet or something. And that's actually not what the Bible teaches. We actually have an article at the cogwriter.com website about uh, several articles about prophets and, and uh, uh, dreams and all those type of things that you can take a look at if you, you wish. Now the other point I want to make regarding Melito is he says that you variously anoint humanity with your festivals. Well, one of the festivals is the Passover, which Melito kept it in the evening of the 14th of the first month of the biblical calendar, which in Melito's day was called uh, Abib, and sometimes called uh, later uh, Nisan as well. And we have a free booklet on that, uh, should you keep God's holy days or demonic holidays. And remember, some of the arguments you, some will bring up as well, those are Jewish, and only Jewish people kept them. No, Melito was a Gentile, he kept them, and he said that God gave the, the festivals. This is 150 years after Jesus was resurrected, plus or minus, pretty close to that. Now, the late pastor general of the old Worldwide Church of God, Herbert W. Armstrong, taught that Melito was one of the true Christians 
observing Passover on the 14th of Nisan, the first month of the sacred calendar. And he also wrote something, and this is going to be from uh, his uh, uh, plain truth about Easter. He, he says first, he wants to uh, quote from uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. He says, Polycarp, the disciple of uh, Saint of John the Evangelist, the Bishop of Smyrna, visited Rome to confer with Anicetus, the bishop of that area, on the subject, who, and he wanted tradition. But, uh, Polycarp said he wanted to do what he received from the apostles, observing the 14th day. Anicetus, the bishop of Rome, declined. About 40 years later, the question was discussed uh, between Victor, bishop of Rome, and Polycrates, the metropolitan of uh, Ephesus. Uh, but actually, he's got Ephesus, Galatia, Antioch, Philadelphia, those mentioned in Revelation 2 and 3, the church established by the Apostle Paul. Anyway, that province was a portion of Christendom that it, it still adhered, this, again, from the Catholic, excuse me, the Encyclopedia of Britannica, to the Jewish usage, the biblical usage. Victor demanded everybody agree to do such things, and, uh, okay. Eusebius, the story of the early centuries of the church, speaks of true Christians observing Passover on the 14th of Nisan, the first month of the sacred calendar. And Polycrates, he recorded what Polycrates said. He said the uh, bishops of Asia Minor, led by Polycrates, decided to keep what they learned. And Polycrates wrote, we observe the exact day, neither adding nor taking away. For in Asia, great lights have fallen asleep. They'll rise again on the day of the Lord's coming. Among those are Philip, one of the twelve apostles, Rover John, who uh, reclined in the bosom of the Lord, Polycarp of Smyrna, who was a bishop and minor, Thracius, bishop and martyr from Eumania, the bishop and martyr Sigaris, blessed Papyrus, and Melito. All these observed the 14th day of the Passover according to the gospel, deviating in no respect and following the rule of faith. Now, all those people that I just listed, starting with the Apostle John, are in the apostolic succession list of the continuing Church of God. Also, the old worldwide Church of God, again, I just quoted stuff that Herbert Armstrong had, written, had quoted, also endorsed Melito's anti-idol position in its literature. And it's interesting that, again, Herbert Armstrong mentioned uh, Polycarp, Thracius, Sigaris, Papyrus, and Melito, all of which are in our succession list. Now, there was a sermon Melito gave on the Passover. He starts off by saying, first of all, the scripture about the Hebrew Exodus has been read. So what Melito was saying is, apparently they used to have two messages, uh, at least two messages, in their church services. And that's what we do today. Our liturgy, if you want to use that term, is consistent with the original liturgy, and that's also documented, by the way, in this free book, Beliefs of the Original Catholic Church. So they said they covered Exodus, so let's go to the 11th chapter of Exodus. I'm going to go through the 11th and 12th chapters, so you might want to follow along. Because Melito's message starts after people have heard this. So I thought I should go over this, and we're going to believe what Melito has to say. Starting verse 1, of Exodus chapter 11, the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. Afterwards, he's going to let you go. He'll let you go. He'll surely drive you out altogether. Now speak now in the hearing of the people. Let everyone ask for his neighbor and every woman her neighbor articles of silver and of gold. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And Moses considered very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the people. And Moses said in verse 4, Thus says the Lord, about midnight I'm going to go to the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt are going to die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sits on his throne, even the firstborn of the female servant who's behind the handmill, and the firstborn of the animals. There'll be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, which is not like it before, nor again. But against none of the children of Israel shall a dog move its tongue against man or beast. And you'll know that the Lord makes a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. And all of these, your servants, will come down and bow to me, saying, Get out, and all the people will follow you. And I will, that, uh, and I will go out. And then he went out from Pharaoh in great anger. 
The Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's not going to heed you, so my uh, wonders will be multiplied on the land. So Pharaoh was warned, but he ah, no. Now the 12th chapter. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, This month will be the beginning of your months. It will be the first month of the year to you. That's the month that's called either Abib or Nisan. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man will take for himself a lamb. If the household is too small for a lamb, then him and his neighbor together, based on the number of people, will see how many they need. Your lamb will be without blemish, a male the first year. You can take from the sheep or the goats. So you notice it can be sheep or the goats. Uh, you'll uh, keep it to the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly will kill it at twilight. They'll take uh, some of the blood, put it on their doorposts where they eat, and they'll leave the flesh that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread, with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. You don't, don't eat it raw or boiled with water, but roasted in fire with his head, legs, and his entrails. Let none of it remain in the morning. Whatever remains in the morning, you'll burn with fire. You'll eat it. Uh, with a bell on your waist, your sandals on your feet, staff in your hand, you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So I'm going to pass through the land of Egypt and that night, and I'm going to strike all the firstborn of Egypt, both man and beast, against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I'll pass over you. That's where the word Passover comes. And the plague will not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be for you a memorial. It means an annual thing. You'll keep the feast of the Lord throughout your generations. You'll keep the feast of everlasting ordinance. Seven days you'll eat unleavened bread. First day you remove leaven from your houses. Whoever eats leavened bread on the first seventh day, that person should be cut out of Israel. And we talk about uh, holy convocations and all that type of thing. Let's go down to verse 18. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of uh, the month at evening. Verse 21. Moses called for all the elders and said to them, Pick out and take lambs yourself according to your families and kill the Passover lamb. Again, it could be a kid of a goat. And you'll take a bunch of hyssop, dip the blood in the basin, strike it on the doorposts, the blood's in the basin. None of you will go out of his house till the morning. The Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. When he sees the blood on the doorpost, he's going to pass over your door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your house to strike you. You'll observe this thing as an ordinance. You and your sons forever. It's an annual ordinance. Come to pass, when you come to the land which the Lord will give you, as he promised, you shall keep this service. It should be when your children say, Why do you mean by this service? You'll say, it's a Passover sacrifice of the Lord who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and delivered our households. So the people bowed their heads and worshipped. The children of Israel went away and did as the Lord commanded them. So what happens? Verse 29. It came to pass at midnight, the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Sarah, who sat on his throne, the firstborn of the captive, who was in a dungeon, the firstborn of the livestock. So Pharaoh rose at night, he and all the servants and the Egyptians, and there was a great cry. There wasn't any house in Egypt, there wasn't somebody dead. Then he called for Moses and Aaron by night and says, Rise, go, both you and your people, go serve the Lord you said. Take your flocks and the herds, be gone, bless me also. And the Egyptians urged the people that they could get out of the land in haste, because they said, otherwise they're all going to be dead. <laughs> What's going to happen next? God <laughs> kills the first four, he's going to kill us all next time. People took their dough before it was eleven. And verse 35, children of Israel did according to the word of Moses. And they asked for the Egyptians articles of silver, articles of gold and clothing. And the Lord gave favor and say the Egyptians. They gave them what they wanted. Then they plundered the Egyptians. Look, they were going to go out in the wilderness, and gold and silver, by the way, was money. They could buy things and they were traveling. Anyway. And so, so then the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkot, about 600,000 men, plus children, plus a mixed multitude. So it wasn't just the uh, children of Israel, there were some other, some other races of peoples who came with it. And they had flocks and herds and lots of uh, livestock, and they baked unleavened cake. It talks about they sojourned in Egypt for 130 years. They came out 
on the, the, the night, uh, which is night to be observed, which is the, the next night, verse 43, is what I want to go to. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this is the ordinance of Passover. No foreigner shall eat it. This is why we don't allow unbaptized people to take the Passover. Uh, that was also the custom of the early church, too, by the way. But everyone serving his wife for money, when you circumcise him, he may eat. Sojourner and hired servant shall not eat it. Uh, they'll be eaten, and you'll keep it, and there be one law among this. And people uh, did this, and they left uh, Egypt. All right, so that's the kind of thing that Melito said was happening before his sermon. So we're going to go now to what Melito had to say. First of all, again, I'm, going to quote, I'm quoting Melito. The scriptures about the Hebrew exodus have been read. In the words of the mystery have been explained to people how the sheep were sacrificed and the people were saved. Therefore, understand this, O beloved, the mystery of Passover is new and old, eternal and temporal, corruptible and incorruptible, mortal and immortal in this fashion. Insofar as it concerns the law, but new and ter old so far as it concerns the law, but new as it concerns the gospel. As far as the gospel goes, you don't have to go there, but uh, John 1, verse 29, John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Based on the old Passover. And regarding some more of that, let's go to uh, the book of uh, Acts. Um, the book of Acts, we find that uh, uh, Philip uh, ran to this eunuch who's reading Isaiah. He said, do you understand what you're reading? He said, how can if someone doesn't explain it to me? And verse 32, it says, the place of scripture which he read was, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, as a lamb before the shearer is silent. He opened out his mouth, in his humiliation, his justice was taken away. Who will declare his generation? His life is taken from the earth. And he said, Who's this prophet talking about, himself or someone else? And then Philip opened his mouth and he preached Jesus to him. And we know the Apostle Paul wrote in uh, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, for indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. So we see it's clear from the New Testament, starting from John the Baptist to after Jesus was uh, killed and resurrected, that Jesus was the Lamb of God. He was sacrificed to be our Passover. Now let's go back to Melito. Passover was temporal in, as it concerns a type, but eternal because of grace. Corruptible because of the sacrifice of sheep, but incorruptible because of the life of the Lord. Mortal because of his burial in the earth. Immortal because he was resurrected from the dead. Yes, Jesus was buried mortal and raised immortal. Getting back to Melito, he wrote, The law is old, but the gospel is new. The, the type was for a time, but grace is forever. Now, let's go to Ephesians 2, verse 8. So here's how we, part of how we know grace is forever. Because it says in Ephesians 2, starting in verse 8, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It's the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. Verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in him. Now, we see the reward, our reward is eternal grace. Since our reward is eternal, grace is eternal. And you don't have to go there, but Romans 5.21, we read, Even so, grace may reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we know that grace God gives us is eternal. And forever, so it's forever. Now back to Melito. He wrote, The sheep was corruptible. But the Lord incorruptible. The Lord is incorruptible. Who was crushed as a lamb, but resurrected as God. His lamb was physical. Jesus was physical. Jesus became God again when he was resurrected. For although he was led to sacrifice as a sheep, yet he wasn't a sheep. Although he was a lamb without voice, yet indeed he was not a lamb. The one was a model, and the other was found to be the finished product. Uh, Melito keeps pointing out there was a physical type as well as later types of spiritual applications. Anyway, back to Melito, he wrote, 
For God replaced the lamb and a man the sheep. That man was Christ, who contains all things. Hence the sacrifice of the sheep and the sending of the lamb to slaughter and the writing of the law, which led to and issued in Christ, for whose sake everything happened in the ancient law, and even more so in the new gospel. Yeah, certainly Jesus' sacrifice was more important than the killing of physical lambs. Anyway, Melita says, For indeed, the law issued in the gospel, old and in the new, both coming forth from Zion and Jerusalem, and the commandment issued in grace, and the type is in the finished product, in the lamb, of the, in the son, and the sheep, in a man, and man in God. So what Melita is also doing is say you can use the Old and New Testament to understand uh, various things, uh, which is what, what, of course, we teach. In fact, we've got a book called uh, uh, Proof Jesus is the Messiah, which has a lot of stuff from the Old Testament that helps demonstrate that Jesus fulfilled the various things in the Old Testament. He was prophesied in that particular book, I mean, in those books. Then Malio says, For the one who was born as a son, led to the slaughter as a lamb, and sacrificed as a sheep, buried as a man, rose from the dead as God, since he is by nature both God and man. Now, as far as his nature, let's go to uh, uh, Philippians 2, verses 5 to 8. Was, was Jesus fully human when he was on the earth? Uh, yes. Now, I'm going to read this from the literal standard version. Philippians 2, starting verse 5. Let this mind be in you, that is also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not something to be seized to be equal to God, but he emptied himself. He emptied himself as a divinity. Having taken the form of a servant, having been made in the likeness of men, and having been found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death. Jesus emptied himself as divinity to live in this earth to actually be able to die for our sins. Anyway, Melito then says... He is in everything, and that he judges the law, and that he teach, what he teaches that he teaches is the gospel, and, and that he saves is, is grace, and that he begets his father and has begotten his son, and that he suffers he is sheep, he's buried, and that in, he's buried he is man, and becomes to life again he is God. Yeah, Jesus was buried as a man, resurrected as God. Such is Christ Jesus, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Now Melito was... Uh, Apparently, quoting the Apostle Peter on this, who wrote to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to him be uh, glory and honor forever and ever, 2 Peter uh, 3, verse 18. Now Melito says, and this is a uh, line 11 here from his homily, now comes the mystery of the Passover, even as it stands written in the law, just as been read aloud only moments ago. And I will clearly set forth the significance of the words of the scripture, showing how God commanded Moses in Egypt when he had made his decision to bind Moses under the lash, but to release Israel from the lash through the hand of Moses. For to see it, he says, that you take a flawless and perfect lamb that you've sacrificed in the evening with the sons of Israel, that you might eat it at night in haste. You are not to break any of its bones. You'll do it like this, he says. In a single night, you'll eat it the families, by your tribes, your loins girded, and your staffs in your hand. For it's the Lord's Passover, an eternal reminder for the sons of Israel. Then take the blood of the sheep and anoint the front door of your houses by placing it on the entranceway, sign of blood, in order to ward off uh, the death angel. For behold, I'll strike Egypt in a single night, and she'll be made childless. Then when Moses sacrificed the sheep and completed the mystery at night, Together with the sons of Israel, he sealed the doors of houses in order to protect the people, the word off of the angel. And the children of Israel did what God said and were protected. Getting back to Melito, line 16. When the sheep was sacrificed, the Passover consumed, and a mystery completed, the people were made glad, and Israel sealed. An angel arrived to strike Egypt, who was never initiated in the mystery participated of the Passover, or sealed by the blood, nor protected by the Spirit. But they were enemies and unbelievers. Well, those in Egypt didn't understand about the Passover, and they presumed that that night would be like any other one. But they were wrong. And their firstborn died. Similar thing's going to happen. It's a great tribulation. Anyway, line 17 of Melito. In this single night, the angel struck and made Egypt childless. When the angel had... Um, encompassed Israel and 
had her sealed with the blood of the sheep, he advanced against Egypt. And by means of Greece, subdued, stubborn Pharaoh, clothing him not with a cloak of mourning or the torn mantle, but with all of Egypt, torn and mourning for their firstborn. For all Egypt plunged into troubles and calamities into tears and lamentations. They came to Pharaoh in utter sadness, not in appearance only, but also in soul. Indeed, it was possible to observe an extraordinary sight. In one place, people beating their breasts and others wailing in the middle of Pharaoh mourning, sitting in sackcloth and cinders. The darkness of Egypt in a funeral garment, a, a tunic of grief. Egypt clothed Pharaoh with a cloak of wailing, such as a mantle that had been woven for his royal body. With such a cloak did the angel of righteousness clothe the self-willed Pharaoh with bitter mournfulness. And we have to be careful about being self-willed and stubborn too. The angel warred against the firstborn of Egypt, swift with death of the firstborn. And an unusual moment of monumental defeat set up on those who'd fallen dead in a moment could be seen. For the defeat of those who lay dead became the provision of death. If you listen to the narration of this extraordinary event, you'll be astonished. For these things beheld, befell the Egyptians in a long night, and darkness was touchable, death was touched, and the angel who oppressed and Hades which devoured the firstborn. But you might must listen to something even more extraordinary and terrifying. In the darkness could be touched was hidden death, which could not be touched. And the ill-starred Egyptians touched the darkness. Well, death and our watch touched the firstborn of the Egyptians, as the angel had commanded. Therefore, if anyone touched the darkness, he was led out by death. Indeed, uh, one firstborn, touching a dark body of his hand, and utterly frightened his soul, cried aloud in mystery and terror. What is my right hand laid hold of? So I'm not sure where Melito got this, but there were some traditions that Jews had. And what does my, why does my soul tremble? Who closed my whole body with darkness? Help me. Go away, for I'm a firstborn son. So apparently he's saying some people had an idea this was going to happen to them. And before the firstborn was silent, the long silence held him in power, saying, You are mine, O firstborn, the silence of death. I am your destiny. Then he says, that apparently it's a tradition, another of the firstborn saw what happened. And he said, oh, I'm not the firstborn. I was, I, I was like the third one. But you couldn't, he couldn't deceive the death angel. So they went as well. So again, there were some traditions. There was things heard in the uh, fields of the earth, cattle bellowing, because the cow was over his calf, or the calf was dead, the mare over her colt. Verse 928, there was wailing and lamentation because of the destruction of the, of the men, because of the destruction of the firstborn were dead. And all Egypt stank because of the unburied bodies. Indeed, one could see a frightful spectacle of the Egyptians who were mothers with disheveled hair, fathers who lost their minds, wailing out in terrified fashion the Egyptian tongue. Oh, what wretched people we are. We've lost our firstborn in a single moment. Such was the uh, misfortune which encompassed Egypt. An instant made her childless. But Israel, all the while, was protected by the sacrifice of the sheep. And for eternal life, of course, we're protected by the sacrifice of Jesus. You know, consider the following. You know, Egypt thought it had safety. Egypt was probably the most powerful nation, at least in that part of the world at the time. But a lot of people don't think something like that can happen again. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Starting verse 3, the Apostle Paul was inspired to say, to write, But when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. They shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so this day should overtake you as a thief. Children of Israel are not in darkness because they did what God said to do. The Egyptians had heard some of it, but they didn't do it. Hey, verse 5, You are all the sons of light and the sons of day. We are not of the night or the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. So we're supposed to be watching things that are going on and not be deceived like the vast majority of the world will be. Now, uh, line 31, or section 31 in, from Alito. 
oh, inexpressible mystery. The sacrifice of sheep was found to be the salvation of the people. And the death of the sheep became the life of the people, for its blood warded off the angel. Tell me, O oh angel, at what were you turned away? At the sacrifice of sheep or the life of the Lord? At the death of sheep or the type of the Lord? At the blood of the sheep or the spirit of the Lord? Clearly, you were turned away. Because you saw the mystery of the Lord taking place in the sheep, the life of the Lord and the sacrifice of the sheep, the type of the Lord and the death of the sheep. For this reason you did not strike Israel, but it was Egypt alone you made childless. What was this extraordinary mystery? It was Egypt struck to destruction, but Israel kept for salvation. You know, a major mystery today is that God's only calling, uh, calling some, uh, and we have a booklet on that, is, is God calling you? And God does have a plan of salvation that many people don't understand. Some are being called now. Others will be called uh, later. Matter of fact, somebody actually telephoned me this week uh, who does not have a Church of God background, but after reading this particular book, sees that God's ways make sense. God's not losing some battle against Satan, and most people are not going to be frying forever like uh, most of the world's churches teach. Anyway, these books are also free at ccog.org. So you can read them anytime. Line 36. Without the model, no work of... Uh... Oh, I'm sorry. I went uh, too far. It's 30, 34B. This is the mystery, meaning of this mystery. Beloved, no speech or events take place without a pattern or design. Every event and speech involves a pattern. That which is spoken, a pattern. That which happens to be a prefiguration. In order that an event is disclosed through the prefiguration. Also that speech may also be an expression through an outline. Now a prefiguration is telling us something else is going to happen. Such as a sudden destruction, by the way, the Apostle Paul is warning about. Anyway, now going back to verse 36, line 36. Without the model, no work of art arises. Is not that which is to come into existence seen to the model which typifies it? For this reason, the pattern of that which is made of either wax or out of clay or wood, in order that by the smallest the model destined to be destroyed, might be seen of a thing that's going to arise higher from it in size and mightier in power and more beautiful in appearance. Line 37. So whenever a thing arises which the model has made, and that which carried the image of the future thing is destroyed is of no, of no longer of use. In well, modern times, sometimes they will keep the models out there and put them in museums or places people can look at them. But Malia was saying there was no need anymore. It was once valuable, but it's now without value because the real thing has come. Each thing has its own time. There's a distinct time for the type. There's a distinct type for the material. There's a distinct time for the truth. You construct a model, you want this because you want to see the image as a future work. You procure the material for the model, you do this because of what's going to arise from it. You complete the work and cherish it. Alone, or only in it, you see both the type and the truth. Therefore, it's like a model of perishable objects. He's again talking about the original Passover. So indeed, it will be those, replaced by those imperishable objects. It was like these with earthy things, and also be then with heavenly things. For even the Lord's salvation and truth were prefigured in the people, and the t preaching of the gospel was proclaimed in advance by the law. And yes, physical things do help teach us uh, spiritual things. As far as the gospel, we've got this booklet which has been translated into, I think, at least 1,400 languages. is available on its line at ccog.org. But for this one, for all the languages, if you just continue down on the the ccog.org page, don't go in the literature tab, you can list, see all the languages that are listed and uh, find out, for example, maybe you understand English because you're watching this, but maybe you could refer somebody who uh, understands Swahili better or whatever to read in their, in their language. Anyway, line 40. The people therefore became a model for the church and the law a parabolic sketch. But the gospel became the explanation of the law and the fulfillment, while the church became the storehouse of truth. And yes, therefore, those in the church should also keep the Passover, which again, I held up our free book, oh, could you, should you keep God's holy days or demonic holidays? And throughout history, by the way, true Church of God Christians have kept Passover on the 14th. Anyway, line 41. 
Therefore, the type had value prior to its realization. The parable was wonderful prior to its interpretation. That is to say, the people had value before the church came on the scene, and the law was wonderful before the gospel was brought to light. When the church came, the gospel was set forth, the type lost its value by surrendering its significance to the truth, and the law was fulfilled by surrendering its significance to the gospel. Just as the type lost its significance by surrendering its image to that which is true by nature, and the parable lost its significance by being illumined through interpretation. So indeed, the law was fulfilled uh, when the gospel was brought to light, and the people lost their significance when the church came on the scene, and the type was destroyed and the Lord appeared. Therefore, those things which once appeared to have value are today without value, because those things which have true value have appeared. Now, by fulfilled, did Melito mean that the uh, uh, Ten Commandments, which we have a book on also, by the way, were done away? No. Well, you know, Peter warned that, the Apostle Peter warned that Paul's writings could be twisted, and they have been, by various certain Protestants that don't think you have to keep Ten Commandments. Actually, Melito wrote lots of statements about the law that some have twisted and uh, misunderstand. He wrote some. But Melito actually endorsed keeping the, the commandments. I'm looking at the time here. I'm not going to go through this. But uh, he actually cites uh, eight of the Ten Commandments. The only two he didn't uh, uh, mention was uh, taking God's name in vain or, or stealing. So I'm pretty sure he wasn't endorsing those. So uh, through what, one the part of his writings, the other, he endorsed the other eight commandments. He, so he was not telling us that when Jesus came, the law was fulfilled so you don't have to keep the Ten Commandments. That was not what he was teaching. He was teaching that many things were fulfilled pertaining to the law. For example, the sacrifices, the uh, sacrifices, uh, and certain things that were prefigured by the Passover, we actually see the realization under Jesus. All right, back to Melito, line 44. For at one time, the sacrifice of the sheep was valuable, but it's now without value because of the life of the Lord. See, he went from what was fulfilled, and now you find out he's talking about the sacrifices, the animals. The death of the sheep was once valuable, but it's now without value because of the salvation of the Lord. The blood of sheep was once valuable, but, was not, was it, but is now without value because of the Spirit of the Lord. The silent lamb was once valuable, but was of no value because of the blameless son. Did you just make that up? No, go to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, starting verse 11, we read, But Christ came, as the high priest of the good things to come, with greater and more perfect tabernacle not made without hands. Well, there was a tabernacle made with hands. I'm talking about a tabernacle made without hands, and it's greater. That is not as its creation. Now the blood of goats and calves, but of his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer Sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from the dead works to serve the living God? So Melito was saying, look, yeah, there was a value for this animals before, sacrificing and stuff, but not, not any longer. Now, the other part of uh, line 44, he says, the temple here below was once was valuable, but now it's without value because of Christ above. Now, this statement from Melito shows that the Jews cannot make the temple of God in our time. Oh, they can build, make some kind of building and they can call it the temple of God, but they actually can't make the temple of God in our time. And according to the New Testament, by the way, uh, the church is the temple of God and we're parts of it. Now, line 45, Melito writes, or states, The Jerusalem here below once had value, but now it's without value because of Jerusalem above. Now, this looks to be a reference to Galatians chapter 4. So let's go to Galatians 4. We're going to start in verse 26. Jerusalem is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, verse 27, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, 
you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Verse 28. Now we, brethren, as Isaac, are children of the promise. We look forward to that, that, that city. Oh, children of the promise, okay. And what do we look forward to? Hebrews 11, verse 16. Give me a second to get there. I ran a few of these scriptures together, I see. But now they desire better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And what's that city? Well, in Revelation 21, why don't you go there? It's not the old Jerusalem. Even though there are some prophetic things that are going to take place in the uh, old city of Jerusalem. But Revelation 21, starting verse 2, we read, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them and they'll be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There should be no more pain for the former things that passed away. So, the Bible is clear. The physical will pass away because it's a type. Uh, Melito continues to go into that in uh, verse 45. He said the meager inheritance once had value, but it's now without value because of abundant grace. And again, talks about Jesus to, to whom be glory forever. He says, verse 46, Now that you've heard an explanation of the type, what corresponds, here also what goes to making it the mystery. What's the Passover? Indeed, it's a name derived from that event. To celebrate the Passover is derived from to suffer. Therefore, learn who the sufferer is and who suffers as long as the sufferer. Why indeed was the Lord present on the earth, in order of having clothed himself with the one who suffers, he might lift him up to the heights of heaven. In the beginning, God made the heaven and the earth and formed people and put him in the garden. By the way of command, God gave him this law, the food you can eat, but don't eat this one tree. But man, who is by nature capable of receiving good and evil, just like the soil, the earth is capable of putting out seeds of both types. Uh, can also be a welcome and greedy counselor. And they transgressed. And it says Adam uh, was condemned as a condemned man was cast into prison. And when he fathered many children grown old, uh, then he, he died. He left his children inheritance, not of chastity, but of unchastity, not of immortality, but of corruptibility, not of honor, but dishonor, not of freedom, but slavery, uh, which we, based on tradition, believe would last uh, 6,000 years until Jesus returns. Verse 50, extraordinary and terrifying indeed was the destruction of men on the earth. Various things happened. They were carried off uh, as slaves to sin. Uh, then it talks about people Parents turning against each other. People became uh, uh, murderers. Even uh, women did as well. And that's going to happen in the future, by the way. Uh, we read, for example, Lamentations chapter 2, starting verse 19. Uh, Arise, cry out in the night. Pour out your heart. Lift up your hands for the life of your young children. Faint from hunger. Should women eat their offspring? The children they've cuddled. That's going to happen again. And I won't read all the curses in Deuteronomy 28, but it's the same basic thing that says there's going to be curses coming and uh, people uh, will even eat their offspring, including delicate people. You'd think they couldn't do it, but uh, the Word of God says they're going to do it. Anyway, going back to uh, first, uh, or line 53, Melito says, in addition, there are many more monstrous things. A father cohabitates with his son, son with his mother, it's uh, brother with sister, male with male, etc., etc. So we, we see uh, Melito uh, also condemning uh, homosexuality back then. Because of these things, sin exalted. Because it was death's collaborator. Uh, all flesh fell out of the power of sin, and therefore death. 50, verse 56, yes, man was divided in parts by death. 
verse 57. Indeed, the Lord prearranged his own sufferings in the patriarchs. And I refer to this because the old patriarchs were in the Old Testament and Jesus fulfilled various things that they either did or said or wrote long in advance. And Melito said, for what was supposed to exist in a grandiose fashion was pre-planned in advance in order that when it should come to existence, one might attain the faith because it was predicted long in advance. And as far as being long in advance, you don't have to go there, but Revelation 13, verse 8 says that all are going to worship the beast coming whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It plans all who has been known, and Melito, line 58, says, So indeed, the suffering of the Lord predicted long advance by means of types. And those types include the Passover ceremony, the old one which involved the lambs, the type of Christ, as well as the atonement ceremony with a goat slain who was a type of Christ. Getting back to Melito. But seen today has brought about faith because it's taken place as predicted. Yet man has taken it as something completely new. Well, the truth of the mystery of the Lord is both old and new. Old because it was a type and new because of grace. So, Melito's trying to tell people this is not some new thing. There was, God had this plan with it. Verse 59. Accordingly, if you desire to see the mystery of the Lord, pay attention. Well, speaking of mystery of the Lord, we have a, a book about various mysteries of the Lord. Pay attention to Abel, and he was put to death. Uh, and uh, Joseph was sold into Egypt. And Moses had his issues, and David was hunted down, and various prophets likewise suffered because they were the Lord's anointed. Melito writes. So, and of course, even prophets suffer because of the Lord's anointed. And uh, Melito may have been including himself in that when he said it. Number 60, pay attention also to one who sacrifices a sheep. For it's through the voice of prophecy the mystery of the Lord was proclaimed. And I mentioned, you know, this particular book, but also in Revelation 19, verse 10, a lot of people don't want to hear about prophecy. It says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And it also said, Moses said to the people, surely you'll see your life suspended before your eyes day and night. And you won't believe as you should. David said, why are the nations haughty? But they've gotten together against the Lord's anointed. And Jeremiah said, and this is actually prophecy about Jesus, I am as an innocent lamb being led away to be sacrificed. They plotted evil against me and said, come, let's throw him a tree for his food and let us exterminate him in the land of the living. His name will no longer be recalled. And Isaiah said, and this again from Melito, about Jesus, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter as a lamb silent in the presence of one who shears it. He didn't open his mouth. Who will tell of his offspring? Indeed, there are many other things proclaimed by numerous prophets concerning the mystery of the Passover. So Melito is quoting the Bible a lot. And says Jesus came and, and uh, uh, he suffered. And by the way, you can read in Hebrews 5, verse 7, that uh, in his days of his flesh, he offered prayers and supplication. Let's talk about Jesus. He, and he's able to save him from death because of his godly fear, because even though he was a son, he learned obedience through the things he suffered. And having been perfected, Jesus became the author of eternal salvation to those who obey him, not just those who believe him, believe that there was a Jesus, but those who actually obey him. Melito continues with, and he destroyed those human sufferings by his spirit, and he killed death. For this one was led like a lamb, this one covered death uh, with shame, plunged the devil into mourning, as happened to uh, Pharaoh, particularly when Jesus was resurrected. And he says, uh, it's turned from, turned from darkness, from slavery to freedom, darkness to light, death to life, and from tyranny into an eternal kingdom, a new priest and a special people forever. The eternal kingdom. Belito taught the gospel, the kingdom of God. This was the Passover of our salvation. 
he says. He patiently endured many things for many people. This is one who came human and a virgin and was hung on a tree. Yes, Jesus was hung on a tree. In Acts chapter 5, verse 30, and go there if you wish, Apostle Peter said, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, who you murdered by hanging on a tree. Getting back to Leto, he says, Jesus was buried in the earth. He was resurrected among the dead and raised mankind out of the grave to below the heights of heaven. Or 71. This is the lamb that was slain. This is the lamb that was silent. This is the one that was born of uh, Mary, who rose to the dead. This is the one that was murdered. And where was he murdered? In the very center of Jerusalem. Why? Because he healed the lame, cleansed the lepers, <laughs> guided the blind with their light, and raised the dead. For this reason, we suffered. I guess us is in our church because we've given money to feed the poor. We're, people think we're horrible. <laughs> And made up all kinds of stuff about us. Anyway, Melito says, somewhere it's written back in the Law and the Prophets, they paid me back evil for good. My soul with barrenness, plotting evil against me, saying, let's find this just man, because uh, he is troublesome to us. Well, that he got from the Septuagint, which is, was not the actual original, but there was some Greek that was around at his time. Anyway, he says, first, 73, O wizard, why did you do this strange injustice? You dishonored one who had honored you. You held in contempt one who held you in esteem. Why did you do this? This is the Bible says, don't shed innocent blood. And that's a citation of Deuteronomy 19, verse 13. Yet Israel admits they killed the Lord. But it would, why? What was necessary for him to die? It was necessary for him to suffer, but not by you. O Israel, you ought to have cried out to God with a loud voice. The Lord, it's necessary for your son to suffer and fit your will. Let him suffer indeed, but not at our hands. Verse 77, but you didn't cry out to do this. The Lord resolve yourself at this. The withered hand, which was restored the whole body, didn't persuade you, nor did the eyes of the blind be uh, healed, or the paralyzed bodies, or a dead man coming back from life. Indeed, you dismissed these things. You have people to dismiss, for example, the dreams and prophecies and stuff, the continuing church of God. He says, you dismiss these things to your detriment. And Christians who dismiss what's going on in the continuing church of God are doing it to their detriment because they're likely going to be, therefore, Laodicean and not Philadelphian. And talk about Jesus having to go through scourges, etc. Et, et and Melita says, you killed the Lord at the time of the great feast. And yes, Passover is a great feast. Verse 80, surely you were filled with gaiety, but he was filled with hunger. O law of Israel, why did you do this extraordinary crime by doing this? You didn't see God? He's the one who set in motion the stars of heavens and all that. And he says, this is the one who chose you, who guided you from Adam to Noah, from Noah to Abraham, Abraham to Isaac and Jacob and the 12 patriarchs. Melito well, is basically saying Jesus was the God of the Old Testament. Verse 84, this is the one who guided you into Egypt, guarded you, kept you well supplied there. This is the one who provided you manna from heaven, verse 85, and raised up your king and sent the prophets to you. This is the one who healed your suffering ones, who resurrected your dead. This is the one who you sold for silver coins. You're ungrateful. How high a price did you place in the ten plagues? Now, let me comment there that Something worse than the ten plagues is going to happen, as Jesus said in Matthew 24, verses 21 and 22. Plus, by the way, the New Testament supports something similar to each of the ten plagues is going to come. And by the way, we have sermons on that that you can watch. Anyway, came back to Melito, 88, he says, How high a price did you place on the column of fire and the crossing of the Red Sea? Uh, he mentioned Brother Hand again, people being born blind again etc. Verse 92, but you, quite contrary, voted against your Lord. And Pilate washed his hands. But you killed this one at the time of the great feast. Therefore the feast of leavened bread has become bitter to you, just as it was written. You'll eat unleavened bread with bitter herbs. Bitter to you are the nails which you made pointed. Bitter to you is the tongue you sharpened. Bitter to you is the false witness you brought forward. Bitter to you are the fetters which you prepared. Bitter to you are the scourges that you wove. Bitter to you is Judas, who you furnished with pay. 
Bitter with you is Herod, who you followed. Bitter he was uh, Caiaphas, who was a high priest, who you obeyed. Bitter is the gall that you made ready, etc. Pay attention and observe. An extraordinary murder took place. He was lifted up on a tree, and there was a description identifying the one who was murdered. Who was he? It was painful to tell, but more dreadful not to. The one who hung in the space is hung. The one who fixed the heavens in place is in himself impaled. He's firmly fixed on a tree. The Lord's insulted. O oh, frightful murderer, with all this injustice. Yet even though the people didn't tremble, the earth trembled instead. The people were not afraid. Let's go to uh, read about that, uh, some of that, in Matthew chapter 27, starting verse 50. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Verse 51, Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked and the rock split. When that happened, you'd think the children of Israel, the Jews that were there, would have thought this was important enough to, to convert, but most did not. And then the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints had fallen asleep were raised. Lito talked about people being raised from the dead. The Jews saw these things in Jerusalem, but they didn't convert most of them. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went to the holy city and appeared to many. Yet when the centurion, it's just a Roman, and those with him were guarding Jesus, they saw the earthquake, the things that happened. They feared greatly, saying, truly this is the Son of God. Why is it like, okay, getting back to Melito now, number 99. Why is it like this, O Israel? You didn't tremble for the Lord. You didn't fear the Lord. You didn't lament for him. You forsake him. But he rose to the dead. From the dead is now in the heights of heaven. Verse 101. He rose to the dead and cried with a loud voice, Who is he who contends with me? Let him stand in opposition with me. Who is my opponent? He says, I am the Christ. I am the one who destroyed death, triumphed over the enemy, trampled Hades underfoot, and bound that strong one, carried off the man of the heights, says, I am the Christ. Therefore, all families of men, you who have befouled with sins, and receive forgiveness for your sins. I am your forgiveness. I am the Passover of your salvation. I am the Lamb which was sacrificed for you. I am your ransom. I am your light. I am your Savior. I am your resurrection. I am your King. Jesus is going to come to establish the millennial kingdom of God. I am leading you up to the heights of heaven, and I'll show you the eternal Father, and I will raise you up by my right hand. And by the way, it says in Acts 2, verse 33, uh, Jesus is exalted by the right hand of God. Now, number 101. This is the one who made heaven and earth, who in the beginning created man, who is proclaimed to the law and the prophets, who became human to, uh, uh, through a virgin. He was hung on a tree, buried in the earth, was resurrected from the dead, ascended to the heights of heaven. He sits at the right hand of the Father. He has authority to judge and save everything. And God has a plan, by the way, to save more than uh, just a few, as I held up. Although God is calling some now, God is going to give everyone an offer to, offer, opportunity for salvation. Jesus just did not come to die for a few thousand people, a few million people, or even only a billion people. Jesus died so all may, might live. And we believe that it roughly would be 99.9% .9 of all the people who were born. That's a whole other topic. I strongly urge people who don't believe that and who claim to believe the Bible to check out this particular book, Universal Offer of Salvation. By the way, that's what original Christians believed, uh, even though the Greco-Roman Protestant churches have pretty well done away with that kind of teaching. Although the Eastern Orthodox have to a little bit. So, anyway, Melito concludes with, about Jesus, this is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. An indescribable beginning and an incomprehensible end. Yeah. This is the Christ. This is the King. This is Jesus. This is the General. This is the Lord. This is the one who rose up from the dead. This is the one who sits at the right hand of the Father, who bears the Father, is born by the Father, to whom be the glory and power forever. Amen. So remember that, by the way, about Jesus. Anyway, Melita was considered a prophet and an overseer in the uh, Church of God. The old Worldwide Church of God taught he's a, a faithful Christian leader. 
And although uh, the Greco-Roman Catholics consider Melita to be a saint, he differed with them on many points. He confirmed the Old Testament should have the books that we, the Continuing Church of God, acknowledge, without the extra ones that the uh, Greco-Roman churches uh, accept. Melito stood for the millennial teaching, which is an integral part of the kingdom of God. He held the original apostolic teachings and is in our laying of hands succession list, uh, leading to the Continuing Church of God. Melito was a Benetarian, like we in the Continuing Church of God are. He taught that the law was fulfilled, because Jesus fulfilled various things, but that the Ten Commandments still should be kept, which differs from a lot of uh, Protestant leaders uh, declare. And by the way, if you're Protestant, we have a book that we suggest you read. If you really believe, you believe in Sola Scriptura, please check this out. You'll find that perhaps you're relying more on traditions, in which was something Melito warned against. Don't rely on traditions of men over what the Bible actually teaches. Anyway, Melito kept Passover on the 14th. He stood against those who had contrary traditions. And his writings were basically shadow banned uh, by Eusebius, and many were destroyed. Otherwise, more people would realize that um, it's the continuing Church of God, and not the Greco-Roman Catholics and Protestant churches to the most faithful. Melito realized that Jesus died as immortal, but he was raised immortal. Melito taught Passover was an annual event to be observed on the 14th day of the first month of the calendar, which is Abib or Nisan. Melito taught what happened to the children of Israel was a type of various things that would affect the church. Melito pointed to Jesus being innocent without sin. He taught that Jesus was the Passover of our salvation and that uh, Jesus needed to suffer and die for us, which he did. Melito's homily showed that the Passover was something that the Christians should observe, and we, the continuing Church of God, uh, observed it annually on the 14th, just like Melito did. And hopefully you'll be doing that uh, this year as well if you're a truly converted and baptized uh, member. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God.